Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you this morning, Lord, for your goodness to us, God. You're so awesome, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we just uh, ask that today you would just help us to really listen to your Holy Spirit through the whole, throughout the whole day, God. Lord, let, Lord, let us just be, be fed by your Spirit today, God, and walk in your Spirit today, God. Let us be a light to this dark world, God. Uh, Help us to be a blessing to somebody today, God. Give us a good attitude, Lord, a, a spirit of excellence, God, so that when we do our work, God, we're doing it for you, God. And, Lord, uh, we just pray, Lord, that, uh, that that we receive something from your word this morning, Lord. Uh, and, uh, Lord, that you, you watch over all those who are sick, God, and, and in the hospital, Lord, and, and they're struggling from this, this coronavirus, God. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you'll you'll help uplift those who are downhearted this morning, Lord, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Amen.
time. Ooh, love that chill. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time, this amazing time in your presence. Thank you for showing us mercy, grace and mercy. Lord, we're so blessed. We're so thankful. We're so honored just to be in your presence right now. We just thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning through your word and your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand. Lord, we just thank you for just clarity of your word, clarity of your spirit. Lord, we just thank you for the, just the spirit of unity and the bond of peace right now flowing in this place. Lord, we just thank you for the spirit of sonship rising up, Lord, rising up in each of our hearts, Lord, allowing us to see not only who you are, but who we are in you. Lead us and guide us today by your spirit and your truth. Lord, we're just so thankful, so grateful. Lord, let this forever be our cry, Lord. Your goodness and mercy, Lord. We thank you. We're so thankful. Lord, we just love you. We bless you. We honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Jake. That's right. That's right. We're on page eight. Diversities of tongues. Walk of spirit, walk of power. We've been talking about the diversities of tongues. It just means differences of tongues. We're moving into the fourth diversity. Um, some of the things that we talked about yesterday, just a quick recap. Um, you know, we read the Great Commission and we saw where Jesus said that believers would speak with new tongues. One of the things that we we would do. Um, and he said when we begin to step out into the things that he says in his word, he says that he will confirm it. He will confirm his word. Amen. Right? Um, we're going to see that today. We're going to... As we look at this fourth diversity, we're going to look at some of the testimonies that uh, Brother Roberson has in his book, and they're, they're really powerful. If you guys haven't read it yet, we're going to read some of it today, but hopefully you guys have caught up to chapter five. I know some of you guys have been coming to me, and some of you guys are actually reading the book. And the guys that aren't, I want to encourage you, man, start reading it. Um, we're going to start reading it some in class, but it's an amazing book, and the testimonies you know, uh, the word testimony, it just means do it again, God. You know, if God did it for other people, you know, he'll do it again for us because he's not a respectable person. Amen. So when you start looking at these gifts, and we talked about this before, like all the spiritual gifts, and let's just look at these four diversities of tongues real quick. Okay. We've got tongues for edification. That's for us. We've got tongues for interpretation. That's in a service. That's for to edify others. We've got... Uh, tongues for intercessional groanings, that's, you know, that's intercession, that's praying for others. And today we're going to look at tongues as a sign to the unbeliever. So we originally saw this in the Word back in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, and people began to speak these languages that they didn't know, and people were there from other areas, and they recognized the language, they recognized their own language being spoken by people who didn't know their language, and this was just demonstrating to them the power of God, right? And the power of God is always going to what? It's going to draw people in, right? And the tongues as a sign to an un unbeliever, the purpose of that is to cause people to look, recognize the power of God, and what? Come into the kingdom. So every single one of these tongues, just like the other gifts, is a manifestation of God's love. Every single one of them. Think about it. And it's his goodness that leads people to what? To repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, when people begin to see the love that he has, the mercy that he has, right? They're drawn in. They're drawn in. And we have become, uh, when, we, when we did our identity class, we saw 
that God took our heart of stone and He gave us a heart of flesh. He gave us a heart, and the Bible literally says that we could keep His commandments. Right? With the sin nature, it was impossible to do it. We saw that uh, in Romans chapter 7. Paul was describing his life under the law before being born again. And he says, the things that I want to do, I don't. And the things I shouldn't do, I do. Right? And that's because he had a sin nature. Right? The law was showing him what was holy and it was showing him what was good. But in that, in that moment, he didn't have the power to do it. Right? But in Christ, we've been given a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, it says, now we can literally walk out the commandments of love. But what do we have to do? We have to now, we have to what? Renew our mind. And allow that transformation to take place. Because we were born into sin. Right? We were born into sin. And before Christ, our, our righteousness was as filthy rags. We, we, we had no way to be righteous. But through the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross, when he was made sin, the Bible says that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. But now we have to what? We have to renew our mind to that. Right? And as we renew our mind, how do we renew our mind? We renew our mind through the Word. We see what the Word has to say about our new identity. And as we read the Word of God and we pray in the Spirit, a transformation takes place. Right? And we're transformed into the image, into His image, into the image of His glory, into the image of His love. And that's what God desires. He desires that we not just do love, but that we become love. Right? It just becomes our nature. Go ahead, brother. I have something to say before it's on my mind, before it echoes off in the silence. So, yesterday, we were talking about the mysteries of God. In Ephesians, I was looking at Ephesians 3 this morning, Apostle Paul, we, you know, we were there yesterday too. Apostle Paul says that the mysteries be made known to you, he's talking to the Gentiles, be made known to you through the gospel. Right? Well, I'm going to get to the point here. In Romans 1.16, it says, the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in it lies the power of God unto salvation. What all is under the umbrella of salvation? Wholeness, holiness, health, wealth, uh, invisible wealth, um, and things of the nature. Then, at the end, toward the end, in Ephesians 3, he says, Be made known plainly to you. Mm. Right? So a lot of times, and it, we keep the commandments. Jesus in the New Testament said, I forget exactly what it says, I leave you a new commandment to love others like I have loved you. Mm -hmm. When I try to compartmentalize so many areas of my life in today's society, I try to micromanage, micro manage some things in my life. And sometimes I overlook the total goal here is for me to do what? Simplify the gospel. I major in the majors, which is what? The gospel. Don't get me wrong, the minors are just as important. However, if I don't get, get it, that I'm called to love others like Jesus loved me, I've missed the mark. Yeah. If I don't, if I know about all the other commandments, about marriage, about masturbation, about greed, if I don't get the fact that i got to love my brother like Jesus loved me, I miss the mark. So this whole class is really, the, the end goal of this book and this class is to help us step into agape love it's the whole purpose of it right and if you think about I got you Jason if you think about um, just praying in the spirit the thing we're talking about now this is how important love is to God pertaining to the gifting he gave an entire chapter 1 Corinthians 14 to make sure this immature church would flow in love because he, real, he realized that if we get out of love with these giftings Instead of drawing people in, we could push people away. So he dedicates an entire chapter on how to operate in these giftings in a church setting. Right? And that's how concerned and that's how much God cares about making sure that we do these things correctly. You know, and as we spend time in his word and we spend time in his presence, and thank God we've had some of these pioneers of the faith that have gone before us and burnt the midnight oil, some of them days, months, years, decades, you know, some of them 40, 50 years just burning the midnight oil, and now they're taking everything that they've gleaned from the Holy Spirit. They're sharing it with us, and now we can add this to the Word and step into some of this wisdom that, you know, all of it, all of it, like I said, is going to be geared toward 
helping us be transformed and begin to walk in God's commandment, which is to walk in agape love. Go ahead, Jason. So, what, like what Justin was saying, I think when Jesus simplified it, you know, with love each other, I think from loving each other, you'll carry out and follow the other commandments. You know what I'm saying? So if I Definitely. Love, one, mm -hmm. love one another, I'm not going to murder or cheat on my wife or this or that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to talk crazy to somebody or whatever, but it just all really stems from that. So that was to simplify it. Plus it was, you know, another commandment and one of the, the major ones, the greatest one. And, and Pastor, yeah. I feel like I need to, or, or not need to, but I feel like I kind of want to hijack you a little bit. I, I, as I'm reading this, I feel like there's something that I want to go over. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So let me ask you this. When Jesus was with the disciples, because we're talking about this baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, empowers us, you, you know, to, to the giftings, and, and, you know, he led captivity to captive, he gave gifts to men, you know, all these different things. We're talking about the benefits of the Holy Spirit but without measure and the different things like that, but when Jesus was with the disciples, they were they were doing stuff. Like he gave them the power to do stuff. Mm -hmm. But what's the difference between then and now? The difference. I mean, I like to go back and look at the Old Testament. Like if you go back to the Old Testament, right? And before the cross, you could say the Gospels was the Old Testament because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. That's right. Nobody was born again. So in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, the anointing, you could even go back to like Samson, right? The Holy Spirit would only come upon prophets, prophets, kings, and priests for a specific task, right? But it could not dwell in them. Oh, Why? Got it, got it. Why? That's the question. Because they had a sin nature, right? And in order for this anointing to dwell in them... Right, and we're going to look at that. We'll probably get in it today when we start getting into uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when we start talking about Moses. They had the sin nature so the Holy Spirit could not come and dwell in the temple, right? Because you can't put new wine into no old wineskins, wine right? So what, had to happen, what had to happen, the difference between the Holy Spirit just mantling us and then actually living inside of us? Like, right. what had to... What had to take place in the heavenly realm for that Amen. to happen? Amen. So we had to receive a new nature. In other, in other words, the temple was made holy. And, and that happened by, by the what? Blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, yeah. right? Yeah. So without the blood, nothing can be Amen. sanctified, right? Amen. It can be made holy. So by blood, the life is in the blood, and all the instruments of the temple, not made with hands, was sprinkled by the blood of Jesus and then made whole, brought back, right? Yeah. So we know that Lucifer sinned in heaven, and then we have, then we also sin and have the sin nature. So that had to be made right to become the dwelling place again right. for Amen. the Holy Spirit. So the Bible talks about our spirit and the Holy Spirit being one, Amen. right? But in the Old Testament, that couldn't happen. No. It, it was impossible. It was just a right. mantle. He's right. like, I could, I could come and I could give you power to do stuff, but I can't live in you and speak to you. Uh, you know, it has to be through a dream or a vision or whatever. But I can't just, I can't just reside inside of you. I have to be in this like tent yeah. that only like the high priest could go to. And there's this veil that can't be even torn uh, torn apart by oxen. And only the high priest with a rope around him, if he's right, could go in there once a year. But now, because of my blood, that one, that perfect sacrifice, I could actually make you my home. Amen. You'll be my people. And that veil was actually symbolic of the sin nature. And y'all know when Jesus, when the, at the cross, that veil was what? Torn. That veil was torn. Right? And the Holy Spirit released. Go ahead, brother. You know, it's like in the Old Testament, you know how Moses was punished for making the, he, he proclaimed to make the water come out of the rock. And God said, you know, cast your shaft upon the rock. So, you know, Moses got punished because he said that he done it. Yeah, instead of bending down and praying like he said, yeah. he, he hit it with his staff yeah. and yeah. came out. That rock represented Christ. Right. Yeah. Yeah, just. I want to say something very final. Oh, by it, I'll be quick. The ABC model. Activating event, belief, consequence. Activating 
event, Jesus shed his blood for us. My belief system, my greatest challenge is not my devotion, my prayer life, my meditation. My greatest challenge is believing in the gospel. Consequence, I, Jesus did what he did. Action part of my side. I got to believe. Right? Believe what? That I won't be a drug addict for the rest of my life. That I can have happiness. That Jesus will shatter the chains that the devil has clipped on my belt to try to keep me bound. And once I believe that, the consequences, there's good and bad consequences in the life. Freedom. Freedom from the world. All right, I got one more. Ready? I got one more. Just, just feel like we need to talk about it. So just a little dispensation like this really. Usually when you talk about dispensation, you're talking about hundreds of years of time. But this is just maybe a few weeks or a few months' time. So Jesus is crucified, goes to the belly of the earth for three days, is, is raised again on the third day, and then over 500 people see him, right, his disciples. Uh, you know, he eats fish with them. He eats with them several times. He, like, walks through a wall, doubting Thomas, puts, puts his fingers in his hands. So here, here they are now. Like, Jesus has died and he shed his blood. That work has been done. That, that, sink, that cleansing has been provided for. Like, that is finished, right? He hasn't ascended to heaven, right? So he says, it's good for that I go, that I may pour out my spirit upon the earth. But the work has been done as far as the temple, mm-hmm. right? Like, Jesus doesn't need to go to heaven to do that. He needed to die on the cross to do that, right? Mm-hmm. And raise again the third day. So he, I'm just, I just want to get this dispensation here and the language of the scripture. So Jesus is in with them. They see the holes in the hand. They're like, oh, I get it. I get what he was saying now, right? He had to die. He had to, he had to die for my sin. Like I, and they're really understanding, I think, fully who he really is. Like the whole, like this dude. You know, they've seen miracles. They knew he was a, a, a prophet. They, you know, he called himself the son of God. And, and Peter even said, you're, you're the son of God. And he said, man has not, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. So, but now they're finally like, Okay, here Jesus is. We saw him. He's dead. He's, he's rose again. We see like these holes in his hand, and this dude is living. This is God. This is him, right? So then in John 20, 20, it says, Jesus, John 20, 22, Jesus breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So I think that, I mean, if you could just imagine that, they're all there. And they had called him Lord before, like Master Teacher. But I think now they were like Lord Jehovah God. Yeah. You know, that, that, that first time ever, they all were sitting there and they believed it. Yeah. And I think at that time, the temple was sanctified in them. Ooh. And he said, wow, Ruach, <laughs> receive the Holy Spirit. So that was... What the new birth, right? Amen. Yeah. So before Jesus went back to heaven, he said, "It's good that I go," because they're like, "Who's going to teach us?" He's like, "No, no, no. It's good that I go, because then I'm going to boom." But then right here, he said, "Receive the Holy Spirit." So the the new birth takes place Amen. right here, right? And then he says, "Then I want you to go wait and tarry in Jerusalem, and then I'm going to send back the pouring out, like what you what you heard about in Joel." And then if you go to Acts chapter 2 here, and this is kind of uh, this fourth diversity of tongue, and that's why I went to look it up and kind of triggered all this. Amen. Um, but it says on the day of Pentecost, you know, the divided tongues, the rushing mighty wind came down, and it, it sat upon them, and then it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. So this is the thing, like people... Get in the they get in the mindset. There's one dis, one denomination that says no, unless you speak in tongues, you're not saved. Well, no. right, right. Yeah. And then there's a and then there's people out there all day because of this that they're like they're questioning their salvation and if they even have the Holy Spirit just because they've never spoken tongues. But I think these two scriptures here, just the end of John, the beginning of Acts, with maybe how many months in between there? A month, two weeks, a week? Between? I mean, what do you think? Since Jesus left, 50 days, fifty days, right? So within 50 days, they had received the Holy Spirit. 50 days later, they were baptized. And a lot of people would teach, no, no, they weren't saved until the day of Pentecost. But Right, yeah. I believe, when, I believe what happened was what he said, right? Received the Holy Spirit. 
Yeah. And the only way they could receive it in that moment was to be what? To be born again. Yeah, now does anybody, because when I explain this, to their, their, my, you know, my stepmother, she's like, no, 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 Jesus was just telling them. He, she says that G, no way they could have received the Holy Spirit because Jesus hadn't ascended yet. And I was like, no, the Holy Spirit is active all on the earth. You know, the, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit has been active in mantling kings and prophets and stuff like that. So, you know, Jesus didn't have to go. Like, Jesus didn't have all the Holy Spirit, you know. Yeah. Like, the Holy Spirit is everywhere, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the, the case. But she said that he had to go, that Jesus was just telling them what was to come on the day of Pentecost. But it doesn't make sense because Jesus, whenever you look at the scripture, Jesus was doing something, he said, you know, Lazarus. It didn't take 50 days for Lazarus to come out of the tomb. Whenever Jesus said something, it happened right then. So if yeah. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, well, I, you better believe. Yeah. That's right. They received the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't speak in tongues then or nothing like that. They didn't, you know, they didn't, nothing crazy happened right then like that, right? Right. Now, now I believe that happened on the day of Pentecost. So just because you called upon the name of the Lord, that means you believed in him. I think they did that right then. They were like, this is him. And then boom. Yeah. They received yeah. the breath of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit, and they were born again. A few points to go with that. One, we, we see this same pattern back in Genesis when God originally breathed that life or Holy Spirit into Adam. Remember that? So we see Jesus doing the same thing, following the pattern of Scripture that the Father did, breathing life back into man, reinstating that life back into mankind. Um, another thing is Jesus only did what he heard the Father say. Right? So if Jesus did that, he did it because the Father told it, him to. It was and time. Third, I believe that the reason why he did that is because there is a difference. And we see that we went through the book of Acts and we saw it um, in Acts chapter 8, eight years after Pentecost. We saw it in Acts chapter 10, 10 years after Pentecost. We saw it in Acts chapter 19, which is almost 20 years after Pentecost. We see where the disciples, they were born again, or they were even people that were not disciples, but just believers in Christ that were born again, but hadn't been baptized right. in the Spirit yet. And we see that pattern in the Word. So I believe that another reason was God wanted to show the difference. Yeah. Okay, we've got uh, reception of the Spirit, born again, and then we've got the baptism of the yeah. Holy Spirit. Yeah, with the you evidence know? of right. speaking tongues. in tongues, or really, like Dion said, it's not just speaking in tongues, but it's a boldness. Yeah, the it's life. an empowerment. Like, yeah. He's like, I want to empower you preach the gospel and do the same works that Jesus did. Amen. So. And I love what you said yesterday, and then Dave, we talked about it later. It's that something about our old nature tries to come in to the new creation. And it's basically kind of the rebellious, don't want to submit, want to do our own thing, and yep. yielding our tongue to the Holy Spirit is a, just a sign of submission, full submission. Like, I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit, and then we allow him to take control. Go ahead, Jared. I feel like, uh, you know, when, when the disciples were walking with Jesus, they may have still had that doubt, but when he was raised, the doubt was erased. And it says, you know, when you pray without doubt, anything you say in my name will be done. Plus, uh, faith of a mustard seed, you know, something just not believe and it'll be tossed in the sea. I feel like, once they received the Holy Spirit, they knew Jesus was raised. The doubt was raised. Yeah. And then stuff started happening. Yeah, yeah. Plus they had that new nature now. Like yeah, they yeah. they had received that new nature and it was just a matter of time. Like go tarry and pray until the spirit comes. Like it's coming. Yeah. 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 But that's the only example in the word where anybody had to tarry. Mm -hmm. I think that Maybe. was the first yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean it may be a little bit off subject, but it just came to my mind. But before Jesus died on the cross, what, what 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 happened to all the men that were here on the earth before before that were I mean Yeah, Abraham's bosom or hell. Yeah. yeah. They you know, if you were under the law, yeah. if you lived under the law and obeyed the law and your sins had been atoned for, Abraham's bosom. If not hell, gnashing of teeth. They, they would kill the animals sacrifice. Correct, correct. So so everybody like every Canaanite and every all the people, all the, yeah, 
Enoch, yeah, Enoch, yeah. So think about they they so like people think you're going to go to hell and live in hell for eternity. No, no, hell is not eternal. It gets cast into the lake of fire, and that is eternal. Am I right? Mm-hmm. So the lake of fire is what's eternal, but hell is just a holding ground in the belly of the earth. As far as Hell, hell is derived from the word Hades. Hades derived from the word Sheol. Sheol means man's common burial ground. Mm-hmm. It's like you go and you die, no, no thoughts, none of that. And then after you've been the bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> he said he, he, the white throne of judgment, he calls out all the people from hell. You know, or if you look at, like, where did Jesus go for three days? It says he went down to the belly of the earth and preached to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. If you go back to Genesis, it says everybody was wicked. Mm-hmm. So who, you know, he wasn't going back and talking to those in Abraham bosom and preaching, telling who he, he was going back to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. So Nimrod, all them dudes, all them bad dudes, that the whole earth was wicked. It's, you know, all them dudes. That's who Jesus went down to the belly of the earth to speak to, to preach to. Like, what happened there? Like, like what was he preaching? The only thing Jesus preached was the good news, right? The gospel. So he's going down all these kids that had been killed, all these that had been sacrificed to Baal, and all that kind of stuff that happened all in that dispensation. Like, Jesus went down and was like, I'm Jesus. <laughs> like, do I, do, I, do, I, do I want to preach over the pulpit what happened from there? No, but it don't take a rocket scientist to see what happened, you know. Yeah. He brought his blood. Amen. So could they repent? Yeah, he said he took captives with him. He said he led captivity captive. So everybody that was held captive, he went down, right? He went down to the belly of the earth for three days, and he took the keys of death and hell. Yeah, so think about that. You think, you think, you ever look at the Old Testament and like, man, God killed all them kids and all them people? Like, what did he do with them? What did he do with them? He said, hey, you guys are going to be wicked your whole lives. Let me hold you down here. I'm, I'm going to send my son down. Yeah. Yeah, that, chance. that just really shows how merciful he is. Yeah. So, that is that, he that, he that, desires that, none perish. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I always like to look at it like this. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit is a well in us, bringing us to eternal life. John when 4. we get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a river flowing out of our heart. That's right. Yeah. Amen. And, and you see the full is overflowing. Amen. You see Amen. the language here between John twenty twenty two received, mm-hmm. and then Acts it says filled yes. with the evidence. Of, I mean, it, it literally says, and they were filled with the, uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely a difference between receiving. And and filled. There's definitely a, a, a bapti- a receiving of and a baptism of or overflowing of. Amen. Amen. And we use the illustration of the water, and I think that's a good one. It's the, yeah. the cup filled up, you know, is, is salvation. My head with all my cup runs over. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's good. Uh, okay. Yeah. So just hijacked you. Let's uh, no, that's good because we need we need to have clarity on these things. Um, on page eight in our outline. Tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. Tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. So this is uh, this is what we saw, one of the diversities that we saw in Acts on the day of Pentecost. We talked about it earlier when all the people were speaking to different languages. And it says, Tongues as a sign to the unbeliever, 1 Corinthians 14 and 22, is an empowerment to speak, preach, or teach in any language. It's a language you didn't previously know. And possibly understood by only one or two people present, and you may you may or may not ever speak this language again. Obviously, this can't be done at will, only by the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna have Josh share this testimony right here from Dave Roberson. Now, start right there. Now I want to tell you. Um, Dave Roberson in this book, the reason why I want to share one of his testimonies is because he said at, this, at the point of writing this book, he had done this 19 times. So I'd say he's kind of, you know, that's one of the areas that God's really using him. And I'd say almost probably more of an expert at it than, than I would be because I've, to my knowledge, I've never done this. So um, I would rather lean off his testimony and see 
you know, how the Lord used him. Now, there's several testimonies in the book that he shares, and they're all powerful, but this was a really good one, I thought. Go ahead, Josh. I will tell you one more example of this diversity of tongues from my own experience. This time the manifestation came in a different way. I was holding a meeting in Florida, preaching up a storm, but I noticed that every time I made a statement of revelation knowledge, a man about three rows from the front would bend over and whisper to the man next to him. My righteous indignation began to get stirred up, and I was getting irritated. I thought, if they're going to interrupt the service, the least they can do is sit in the back. Somewhere in the middle of my message, the two men stopped whispering to each other, which helped me concentrate, and God performed all kinds of miracles that night. After the service, I was in the back room recovering when the pastor came in to talk to me. She said, did you notice those two men who were whispering to each other during the service? Yes, I replied. They talked about a third of the way through the message and then stopped. Well, one of them only speaks French, and he brought his own translator so he could enjoy the service. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh. But just as I started to feel badly for my irritation with the two men, the pastor interrupted my thoughts. This Frenchman said that one-third of the way through the service, you stopped preaching in English and started to preach in French. But I didn't preach French, I protested. Well, he says you did. Okay, I said, have someone asked a Frenchman who can't speak English what I preached in French? And someone talked to the man and found out, found out that I had preached the exact same message in French that I had preached in English. Now, it's one thing for the Holy Ghost to move through you and inspire you to preach what he wants you to preach. But it's another thing for the Holy Spirit to take the message you receive by revelation and translate it for you into French. And that means your revelation is right on. And the message I was preaching that night is the same one I am discussing uh, in this chapter. So, but everybody else still understood in yeah, English, yeah, too. Right. So that lines right up with the day of Pentecost. Right. Mm-hmm. They were like, it says, it's, it, I have it right here. Can I read it? Yes. It says, and there was dwelling. So this is right after the Holy Spirit fell on them. And it says they began to speak in other tongues as God gave them utterance. And it says, and there was, it says the crowd's response. And there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because every one of them heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language and we which we were born? And then it lists like 30 different languages. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, that is like lines right up. Right. Amen. Yeah, so it's not like people even, like if you, if you speak Spanish and I speak French, we both can understand what you were saying, but you didn't know. I mean, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. I, you know, nobody knew. Just everybody could understand. Yeah. That's pretty... It's pretty amazing. So it was a sign to the unbelievers. Yes. Was he speaking in tongues yeah. in the message? Or? Yeah. Language, right? He doesn't know. He didn't know. Like everybody everybody heard him. It's almost like God really like did something with the French dude's ears. But so that, that's a manifestation on both sides, the ones speaking and the ones that are hearing, because the Holy Spirit's translating through the ones that are hearing, like he's translating through the uh, through the one that's speaking and showing the oneness in spirit. That's right. You know, showing that he, he will give himself that, that the unity between everybody. But the thing that we have in common is the Spirit of God. Amen. That's right. So, I think that God's wanting to really expand, and that's one of the gifts, uh, praying for edification. He's wanting to expand our knowledge of him and who he is, his greatness, his awesomeness. Yeah. You know, and just really, really... Uh, I believe building up faith in a generation to begin to walk in some of these things. And he said, Jesus said himself, he says, the works I do, he says, you shall do greater works. And we talked about that the other day, how people came up and they touched Jesus and they were healed by the hem of his garment. And then you had Peter would walk by and his shadow was healing folk. You know, and that was, that was the infant church a couple thousand years ago. And now he's saying... You won't only do the works I did, but greater works. And I really believe he's building up our faith, as you were saying, Jared. He's building up our faith to be able to believe in the supernatural. And he says when his word, his word 
was going forth back then, he would accompany his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. What do you think is going to happen now? Yeah. He's not a respecter of persons. Right. He's not just showing us these things to just say, hey, look, this is what I can do. He's showing us these things to say, hey, I want to do these things through y'all and even greater things. Yeah. Just yeah. believe. All things are possible to those who believe. Amen? Amen. Go ahead, Jared. Uh, isn't the, the, the language thing kind of has me, it, it's kind of like before the Tower of Babel, when everyone was on one accord. Yeah, that's that's a good the words point. are the same. Yeah, everything was everything everything, was the everything same. heard the same language. Yeah. yeah. Like you see, so God like caused that confusion between languages, but then in the supernatural realm, it's like we're we're back to the original creation. Like yeah. he breathed the breath in, and then so he could supernaturally and everybody's on one accord. Think about the fire. Yeah, I've never thought about that. Yeah. That's pretty fire. Think about why you have the the, the method and the means in which they were trying to attain God in Genesis. Like we're going to build something that we can climb tall enough to reach Him. But the Word says no man can come to the Father but through Jesus. And who's the very next person that Peter begins preaching about when everybody begins to hear them speak? Jesus. So now you have a proper avenue to attain the Lord. Right, so initially you had wrong, yeah, totally yeah. wrong. We're trying to do it on our own with our works or with our building or however you want to, you know, you can do that. But then later on, when Jesus redeems that confounding, right, says he confounded the languages, now the people of the languages are confounded. It's, it's inverted, it's reversed. So they've, they, it, there's a full turnaround because now instead of us trying to do it on our own, there's a provided way. Hey, you, a long time ago we tried to do it like this, but here's the way to do it now. And 3,000 are saved. Boom. And remember, the whole purpose of all these giftings, and now you can really see it, is what? So that all men be drawn. be drawn to Him. It's love. You know, God's like saying, if I can't reach you this way, I'll use this yeah. to reach you. Or I'll use this to reach you. I'll use this. I'll use this. Whatever it takes. He knows where to meet us at. He knows what it takes. That's how powerful, that's how awesome He is. And the cool thing about it is He's using us. You know, and all He's looking for, we talked about this yesterday, all He's looking for are people that will believe and people that are willing. Amen. Another thing, too, you want to point out is, like, these people will look at this one scripture and they'll, they'll get, like, a revelation or understanding about this certain diversity of tongue but aren't willing to admit there's other diversities. And that's what happens. You put you put God in a box, and you create this whole denomination. Every other scripture that you ever read after that is read through the lens of your denomination. Yeah. And that is just... Narrow-minded. Yeah. That, that, and that's just... A, I mean, really, if you look at it, it's like the enemy like wants to box you up. Like, yeah, box God up. Because if you box him up, you're boxed up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. But this is clearly... You could read, I mean, if you go to 1 Corinthians 14, you just read it, and he is like literally in that chapter explaining two or three different instances of tongues. So you can't say there's just this one time, one instance, this is how it has to go. You know, it's just, why would you? Amen. Amen. Let's uh, quickly, because we only have a couple minutes, let's go down to the bottom of the page. I want to. I want you guys to be able to understand 1 Corinthians 12, 29-30 because a lot of people have actually used this verse to discredit tongues. But we know from our opening verse, we know from Mark 16, it says, well, our opening verse yesterday, we talked about it earlier, Mark 16 says that believers will what? Speak with new tongues. Yep. It didn't say some believers, it just says those who believe, right, shall. And then we see the pattern in the book of Acts. We see it in 1 Corinthians 14 when uh, Paul talks about, uh, you know, everybody has a tongue when you come into a service. So I want to break this down because I want you all to be able to explain it to others when other people have this question. Josh, can you read uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 29 through 30? All, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts? And yet I show you a more excellent way. Yeah, so I could see 
where you're talking about there. Because in Mark it says, this is a sign of a believer. Yeah. Any believer, not right. apostles, not anything. And, of course, you're talking about tongues and edification, not messages in tongues, which is a spiritual gift here. Right. I get it. I get it. So, let's read our notes in our, in our binder. It says, Paul is speaking of specific manifestations. Not everyone is called to every gift of the Spirit. Not everyone is used in every gift of the Spirit. Not everyone speaks in tongues for interpretation. However, everyone should be willing to speak in tongues for prayer. So, yes, we know everyone's not called to be an apostle, prophet, pastor, the fivefold ministry. So when he says, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, he's not talking about do all speak in tongues for edification. He's talking about do all speak with tongues for interpretation in a service. Yeah, man. It's the same thing with healing. Like, you see people like Catherine Coolidge or Peter that have that, like, healing gift anointing. Like, you, you know, like, go to that guy. You know what I mean? But then it also talks about being the, the, the prayer of faith. Laying hands on the sick. Laying hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Yeah. So you know that every believer has the access to the prayer of faith. Laying hands on the sick, they shall recover. And then you see separately in Corinthians 12, there is actually a gift, like an anointing for healing. Amen. Like, yeah. So tongues for interpretation is used, we read in 1 Corinthians 14, to what? To edify the body. Right? So you had people, and he gives guidelines in 1 Corinthians 14, this is how many people I want flowing with this gift in a service. And the purpose was, let's keep things in decency and in order. Let's just don't have like, yes, everybody, if everybody, if you're willing to do it, God can use you to do that. But that doesn't give you the right to stand up and just do it in a service when you've already had things in order and God has already been using this gift in, in this service. That doesn't give you the right. Just because you have the ability to do it, it doesn't give you the right to stand up and be used in that service if the Spirit hasn't called you. All things are beneficial, but yeah. not all things are And you have to call that into question, too. If God is a God of order, right? He, he's the one that's a God of order, but he's the one pouring out the Spirit for the gift. I mean, were those people really hearing? Or was it like, oh, I got this gift, or, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove to everybody that I got this. Was it about them, or was it about God? Because would God disrupt his own service? No, I don't think so. Right. So not everybody will be young, used for tongues for interpretation in every service, and that's what he's saying. I believe at the time the people were so excited about the gifts that God was giving them that they were a little overzealous and tended to yeah. you know, or want to speak in tongues yeah. at one time and got, got a little wild with it. And it all goes back to love. You know, because there are people out there, if they see things getting out of order like that or they hear somebody get in their flesh and one of these giftings, it could it could push them away and really yeah. you know, even be even even to the point to cause them not to want to be saved. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, just on the love point, I think um, when you get into things like that, I know that there are people I've been in places where the church body is functioning uh, maybe according to the spirit, but not to its fullest capacity. So some people think that they're going to jump start the mower by just spouting off the mouth because they operate according to a deeper level of revelation knowledge or of some type of discipline or education or whatever and they think that that's going to elevate, elevate yeah. what's going on in the body that's not quite there yet so some, and I've been there I've literally watched sometimes the intentions are good but it's I mean bang out of order way Talk out of the me, way bro. and you've got <laughs> to you've got to figure out not really figure out you, I mean, you have to understand how to operate according to the law of love there are tons of people that I love with all of my heart that are not quite at the level that they could be operating at yet, but it doesn't mean that I run around and lord over them the things that I do operate to show them what you could do in a manner that's condescending, because really that's what it comes off as. Yeah, Yeah. and and what I'm not doing, I'm not bringing order to their life, I'm bringing a lot of confusion and, and like you said, potential hurt and unfairness. It's It's not done... Out of love, yes, but I don't think it's done out of pure love. And that those are things that we've got to learn how to operate out of instead of show-off love. Because I think there's a really big difference. Amen. Especially like on this topic. Amen. So with that same thought, we'll close with this. 
when you go back now and you read 1 Corinthians 14, when it's actually dealing with tongues for interpretation, it makes now it makes more sense and there's more clarity. Listen, it says, How is it then, brethren? So it's talking about believers. Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, each of you has a teaching, each of you has a tongue, each of you has a revelation, each of you has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Right? So if I have a tongue and an interpretation and I'm not doing it for edification, then I'm doing it for the wrong reason. I might just be in the flesh or I might be trying to, some people try to draw attention to themselves. Right? So watch this. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three at the most, each in turn, and let one interpret. Of course, he's talking about a service here, in a service. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all but may be encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the, pro- subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let's go down to verse uh, 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not, do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Yeah. And there's nowhere, anywhere in the word that said... When Paul died, that stopped. Like if you said, well, Paul died, so that, that's, that dispensation's over with the last apostle that died. He, first of all, he would have said that, and that means that pretty much every writing that Paul wrote is also dead, but it's yeah, not. Yeah. Amen. But it doesn't make sense. That, that thought process of that's passed away, like, hey, because I've never experienced this, it's passed away. I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's the way I want to go with that. The direction I want to go with that. Amen. No. Amen. Yeah. So, so Paul, the Lord is building us up, right, on Revelation. He says, I'm going to build my church on Revelation, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail. So he's building us up. And, and Paul said this. He says to the Corinthian church, he says, look, there's things I want to reveal to you, but you're carnal. We're going to start talking about this tomorrow. He wanted to take them from the, the, the milk of the word to the meat of the word, Right? So, if we went back, we went back to Hebrews, and we saw that the doctrine of baptisms, which is what we're talking about right now, was the milk of the Word. Right? So, God, I believe this group, our group, God is wanting to take us into the deeper things of God. God is wanting to take us from the milk into the meat. Right? And God is wanting to pour something out, not just on us, but on the earth, on the body of Christ, right now in this age. That will literally turn the world upside down. Right? We see all this darkness coming right now in the earth, covering the earth. But the church, Isaiah 60 says, the church, my church, will what? It's going to get brighter. Right? God is raising us up and he's wanting to release something in our life that's literally going to change the world. Right? And he's calling us up. He's calling us to a new place. Right? And that's why he's teaching us all these different things about the word is because he's wanting to entrust us with more he says if you're faithful over the the little things he says i what i'll make you a ruler over the many and i'll entrust you with more of my anointing more of my power more of my wisdom more of my glory why so you can go out and you can make an impact because he desires that what that none perish but all come to repentance and there's so many different ways we're seeing in the word that he's able to get to people and reach people and all he's looking for is a willing church that's willing to go out and say, God, I believe you, I trust you, and to just step out in faith. And when we do that, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accompany my word with signs, wonders, and miracles. There's a growing sense of urgency that's growing every single day. Amen. There's a, there's a, a spiritual outpouring yes. going on right now. Yes. For those who want to receive it. Amen. Amen. Yep. Yep. And it says all the creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, one of the first things he said to man was be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. I think he's still got that same commandment today. It's the same thing he's wanting us to do. Be full of the fruit of the Spirit. Make disciples and subdue this earth. Usher in the kingdom of heaven. You know? Amen. Right here. Amen. 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 That's good. Thank you, Lord. Prayer requests, testimonies?